Well, hello, and thank you for inviting us to your speaker series. We are a group of people who have been developing the XR Access Strategic Plan, and we're uh, very much excited about presenting that to you today. The group of us, uh, I am Larry Goldberg, and I'm the head of accessibility for Verizon Media and one of the co-founders of the XR Access Initiative. Hi, I'm Christine Hempel. I'm the founder and managing director of Open Inclusion, and we're an inclusion, our inclusive design, insight, and research organization. Regine. Hello, everyone. I'm Regine Gilbert. I'm an industry assistant professor at NYU's Tannen School of Engineering. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Dylan Fox. I'm a staff research associate at UC Berkeley. Uh, and I'll go ahead and open it off here um, by first uh, talking about something that is uh, just a simple question that, that matters quite a bit for the rest of this presentation. Um, and that is, what is XR accessibility? And more importantly, why should you care about it? Um, so first we're going to define, to define XR accessibility, we're going to define XR and define accessibility. Um, so as I'm sure many of the viewers of this series are going to be aware, um, XR, which is short for extended reality, uh, is a mix of a couple of immersive technologies. Um, you have virtual reality in which you wear a headset that totally blocks out the world around you and transports you into this virtual world. Um, you have augmented reality in which you augment the world around you with new information. Uh, and you have mixed reality where you mix together um, virtual objects and real world spaces. Uh, and so all together, they make XR. Um, so now let's define accessibility. So if something is accessible, that means that anyone can use it regardless of ability. Um, now, when a lot of people think about accessibility, they think only about access for people with permanent disabilities, you know, people who are permanently in wheelchairs, uh, blind or so on. Um, but one of the reasons that accessibility is so important is that disability comes in all forms. It can be permanent, but it can also be temporary or, or situational. Um, we'll see here in a, a chart from uh, Microsoft's Inclusive Design Toolkit um, that something that you make that's going to be accessible to somebody who, for example, is permanently deaf, um, if you make an accessibility feature like captions, uh, that's going to be useful for that deaf person. It's also going to be useful for somebody who has an ear infection um, and for somebody who's in you know, a, a crowded and noisy bar, which will happen soon again, I'm sure. <laughs> but accessibility is important for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, because first and foremost, it's, it's just a human right. Everyone deserves to have access uh, to the technology that we've all been working together to create. Um, and secondly, accessibility creates better experiences for everyone. Um, when you have something that's accessible to everybody, uh, everybody is going to find better ways to use it. Um, now, within XR accessibility in particular, uh, it's important for a couple of reasons. Number one, XR is really growing fast in terms of its capability, in terms of its uses, uh, and in terms of its popularity. Um, we have a lot more cases of XR being used in jobs for training and, and uh, you know, manufacturing, um, in education, in healthcare, in a million other areas. Um, and without making XR accessible, people with disabilities would not have equitable access to all of those benefits. Um, so that's obviously really important. And second, XR is, is uh, really incredible in that it is making new opportunities around communication, remote access, telework, um, all of these different cases and enhancing the accessibility of those uh, is going to be vital to making sure that everybody in the world is able to, to make use of these. Um, you know, we, we have this gap between technology creation and technology inclusion um, with TV that was 60 years before we started really closing that gap. For streaming media, it was five years. For you know, iPhone, smartphones, it's, it's been even smaller. Um, and if we can get XR to the point where we can make it accessible even before it really gets out there and gets to, to commercial scale, 
um, that's just going to be incredible and will save us a lot of time and money and uh, and pain on, on behalf of those who, who would otherwise be left out. So just to give two concrete examples of what we're talking about here, um, when, we, when we talk about the challenges of XR accessibility, um, here, here's an example of something that's old that we're going to have to rethink when it comes to XR, and that is captions. Um, you know, we have had captions for 2D uh, media for ages now. Uh, it, it's a pretty well-known quantity, but for XR, there's a lot of new challenges that come into it here. Um, the, the clip we see here is, is from um, Alchemy Labs Vacation Simulator. Uh, we see, you know, you're, you're in VR, you're watering a garden, um, and there's a bot talking to you. And the captions for this bot, you can't just kind of put it on the bottom of the screen because where, where's the bottom of the screen when somebody's kind of looking all around in this 3D world? Uh, and so what Alchemy Labs did is basically let those captions float, um, put it at, at this kind of right distance in between you and the environment to make it feel natural. Um, they have an arrow pointing back at the bot and a little icon so you know who's talking, even if you're looking in the totally opposite direction. Um, and so these are examples of, of some of the ways that, that we're going to have to rethink these old systems to make them new again and to, to make them um, useful for this new format. Uh, and now a second example is a totally new challenge. Um, one of the things that, that has gotten people so excited about XR is your ability to, to bring your whole body into it, um, to have this, this kind of physicality uh, and to, you know, unlike in, in maybe old video games where you're pressing a button to, to swing a sword and pressing a button to raise a shield. In XR, you can really swing your sword arm, swing your arms around, swing your, you know, move left, move right, which is great, but it means that for people with, um, you know, particularly mobility impairments here, um, we need to come up with new ways to make sure that these exciting experiences are still usable for them and still accessible. Um, the, the example we see on screen here is something called uh, Walk-In VR, which is for Steam, a plugin that lets people with mobility impairments um, do things like uh, simulate having another hand, um, do quick turns that, you know, if you're in a, a wheelchair is typically be impossible for you to do. Um, and so coming up with tools like this that will help us, um, you know, still have these amazing experiences, but make sure that they're accessible to everyone. Um, and ideally even, you know, for example, with people who are blind, letting them take the, the things they're comfortable with and familiar with, like taking a white cane into a VR scenario, um, things like this and, and challenges like this are things that we're gonna have to overcome if we want these technologies to really live, uh, live up to their full potential. Um, and so to talk more about an organization that has been dedicated to doing just that, uh, I'm gonna pass it over to Larry. Thanks, Dylan. A couple of years ago, uh, 2009, actually, 19, uh, Professor Shiri Azenkot from Cornell Tech in New York approached me uh, because our company had been funding some of the work uh, out of her lab at Cornell Tech. And she suggested that the time was right, or maybe even a little bit late, for us to be taking a deep dive into how we're going to make this new virtual, these virtual worlds accessible. And she suggested that we put together a little symposium. And uh, of course, in the nature of uh, for-profit giant corporations, I thought about scaling and thought this is the right time and the right place to really dig into how we're going to make the infrastructure, the underlying technologies for virtual realities and XR fully accessible, no matter what kind of application you're looking at, what kind of uh, world you're seeing. And so together, we realized it was time to put together uh, some work and thus became the XR Access Initiative. And with that first symposium and now uh, two behind us and another one coming up, we began to do a significant amount of uh, brainstorming, uh, strategic planning, all of the people on this presentation today were part of that. And we put together an explicit purpose. That purpose is to create a community that engages, connects, and influences the field of XR in order to build and share knowledge, skills, tools, user experiences, and leading practices to make XR inclusive of all, regardless of abilities. The tie-in was the kind of communities of academia, 
uh, corporations and uh, most explicitly our stakeholders, that is people with disabilities. And uh, that work has been uh, going forward. There'll be a link at the end of this presentation to the actual strategy overview for 2020 plus. Uh, right now, I think we're uh, tying in at least five years into the future. Our mission on the next slide you'll see is to modernize, innovate, and expand XR technologies, products, content, and assistive technologies by promoting inclusive design in a diverse community that connects stakeholders, catalyzes shared and sustained action, and provides valuable and informative resources. And pictures on this slide are actually from our uh, 2019 uh, get together at Cornell Tech's campus on Roosevelt Island. And it was a phenomenal experience that then really did trigger uh, all of the sub subsequent action that uh, has taken us to today. Uh, our vision will be described by Regine Gilbert from uh, NYU. Thank you, Larry. So our vision is inclusive design becomes a core part of all XR creation. Uh, resources on XR accessibility are widespread. People with disabilities are an integral, uh, integral part to shaping uh, the future. And many identities and personal characteristics are explored within XR accessibility. Our core values essential and enduring principles that guide the behavior of the organization are focus, approach, and style. For focus, it's efficient and useful for both present and future environments and outcomes, and evidence-based, pairing creators with users to define needs, co-design, and user test solutions. For approach, it's welcome, enable, and empower diverse involvement and inclusive engagement, user-centered on needs of people with cognitive physical, mobility, and sensory disabilities, nimble and adaptable to changing needs of the XR community, I'm sorry, XR business and technology community, and style, a collaborative, catalytic, a change agent, and a connector. Our stakeholders, um, we've, we've updated this in our, in our 2020 strategy, our researchers and end users, app and content creators, platform products and associations, policy and education, consultants and employers. So for research and end users, these are academic researchers, non-academic researchers, think tanks, UX researchers, user panels and user advocates. For app and content creators, these are incubators, dev shops, accelerators, uh, investors and social good, nonprofits, enterprise app developers, UI UX designers, content studios, and independent creators. For platform products and associations, these are trade associations, product owners, hardware, hardware product manufacturers, software platforms and developer tools, network infrastructure, and assistive tech developers. For policy and education, we're looking at disability advocacy, public policy, government organization, NGOs and conveners, standard development organizations like the W3C, OpenXR, et cetera, and educators. And for consultants and employers, this is uh, accessibility consultants, disability-led panels and consultants, and compliance and risk consultants. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Christine. Thank you, Regine. So accessibility uh, in XR, well, XR itself is an emerging technology and a very innovative, fast moving technology. So we looked at it from a strategy perspective in how do we enable a strategy that is sustainable to create kind of a long term impact in this fast moving space. And that really brought us to this three part process. One from a design perspective, and you know, each of these have the users at the heart of it. 
what is the necessity and what is the desirability from a user perspective? What makes this a must, you know, what are the must to haves here and what will make this a delightful experience for all users? From the technology perspective, you know, again, very fast moving, but what is feasible today? What is, what do we, would we like to be feasible in the future? And how are we keeping our eyes on that moving goal and using the technology as it comes online really effectively for users? And then from the business side, importantly also, how does this really enable a viable, profitable, useful um, and practical product that businesses wish to put out there or service that they're going to use within their workforce? So that kind of three part model then really helped us in the next part, which was designing our work streams. So we've created these three work streams, each which has one of those focus areas. So IDXR is inclusive design for XR, and that's bringing the design mentality to this and really thinking about what is it that will delight users and provide a really good experience? How do we listen to users to understand what the needs are and how they're experiencing that within the technology as it's standing today? How do we then frame the knowledge that is out there, bring together and collate and curate the, you know, the kind of leading waterline, the high waterline here. And then how do we fill those gaps between what we have today and where we'd like to get with inclusive design in this new space? Um, approaches, tools, practices, things that make it easier for people in their specific role, in their specific industry, using whichever technology they're using to do that more inclusively and accessibly more easily. And then iterating and improving on that. Um, same with ADXR is the technology focused um, XR. So it's, the des it's really that technical design and capability. What do we need to be moving forward in the technology itself? What do we need to use better within the technology that is there but under leveraged? And how does that support the IDXR, the design? And how does that also really support the business case and the efficiency of the development? which takes us to the third one, the business case for XR. And this is really that um, business oriented one, which is how do we really efficiently create tools, capabilities, services and solutions in the XR space that are going to be profitable, desirable and useful for businesses to wish to pick up and use long term. Across each of these work streams, we realise that one of the most important things is that they're all connected and they're both connected to the outside world in a really effective way, but they're also connected to research and new insights because this is, is, is you know, I keep mentioning, you know, such a, a emerging field that there's constantly new information coming into the system. So there's these two kind of horizontal streams that help us connect across all of them, but also connect out into the broader world really effectively. One of them is the customer engagement team, and that will both listen across those three communities, package that in a way that can be consumed and shared and, and publicized and used by people across the industry. Um, but also listen to industry as to what's really important to them and ensure that that's coming back into XR Access so that we're addressing the problems that are really most relevant and important to the community. Um, the other one is the research arm, which is, again, critically important because that's the enabler of the future of the technology. And so really connecting those organisations, the, particularly the education, you know, higher educational organisations, that are moving at the edge of this space and ensuring that their work is connected with each other and is then connected back into the community of people using it. So they're the, um, the two connective tissue really across the three primary work streams. Next slide. So over to you Larry. now. Thank you, Christine. So why should you care folks from Microsoft Research? Um, we have established what we're doing in this XR Access initiative to be as thoroughly engaging and uh, focused on outreach as we possibly can. When we developed a strategic plan, we had uh, more than the four of us involved. Uh, the XR Association under Elizabeth Hyman, uh, Bill Curtis Davison from the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology, of course, Cornell Tech, uh, Professor Azencote and Jesse Garrett-Taft, 
Joel Ward from Booz Allen and many other thinkers got our draft together. And then we reached out to a much wider world for input. And we had hundreds of people at both the um, strategic plan and our symposium. We had 40 countries involved in last year's symposium. And we are gathering as much information as we can. We would like to be a hub for anyone and everyone who is doing work uh, in the field of XR accessibility. That includes the World Wide Web Consortium. Of course, great work being done at Microsoft, over at Oculus. They're doing some very interesting work on this. The gaming world, of course, has long been involved in building out uh, accessible games. So we would ask you to get involved in one of those work streams that you heard described. Uh, share the challenges that you're facing as you do your development work when you think inclusively and diversi uh, diversifying your work. And we're gonna give you some context about that in a moment. Uh, of course, as you develop some interesting technologies and techniques, we'd love you to share that. And we will help share that out to the rest of the world uh, through all the channels that we've developed. Uh, and then coming up in June, date to be announced, but it'll be in June of this year, our third annual symposium will be very rich, full of conversations, presentations, demos, uh, some cutting edge work being done in the field. And we'd love for you to be involved in that as well. Uh, on the next slide, uh, Dylan, you'll see ways you can contact us. Uh, the website has the complete strategy, resources, demonstrations. Uh, so poke around at xraccess.com. Uh, actually, it's .org. I'll have to change that slide, xraccess.org, uh, and you'll see the strategy there. We are on Twitter at xraccess, and any email that comes to info at xraccess.org will go directly to uh, the principals here who uh, are managing this project. We'd love your involvement. There's a form you can fill out that talks about how you would like to be involved. And that will come directly to us as well. Uh, so we're reaching out to the world now. We've got a lot more to come, and you'll hear more at the symposium, but even before then. Um, and at this point, uh, we really appreciate your inviting us, and we will be taking your questions and answers. <laughs>